It's a real uh, pleasure and a privilege for me to introduce our speaker tonight. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, Martha Sontag Bradley Evans. Did I get them all? <laughs> uh, I have known Marty for many years, and uh, we've had some interesting experiences together, including, I guess you'd have to call it a near-death experience. <laughs> At least everybody on the plane thought they were going to die. Uh, we were flying to John Wimmer, yeah. what was it? And I'll just be really quick with this, but uh, very memorable for us. Uh, we're flying into Denver, and the whole way it's an extremely bumpy ride. The wing, the pilot can't keep the wings steady, and it was very, it was nauseating, and it was scary. And anyway, we're coming in for a landing at Denver. And we're probably, I don't know, maybe my memory isn't accurate, but it seemed like about 50 feet off the runway, and then he powers up and pulls out of the landing. And you don't see that or feel that every day. Um, and it just totally freaked everybody out. And there were, I mean, up to that point, there were people, I believe, perhaps even our guest speaker tonight might have been using the air sickness bags. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Albert Peck from Sunstone was on board and he was convinced that we were going to die. <laughs> he even said that aloud more than once. <laughs> uh, it is funny now, but it wasn't funny then. Um, the, but to me, the irony, and it actually turned out to be pretty funny, is that in front of me was uh, Elder Kikuchi of the 70, and behind me were Marty and from, we were Dialogue then, editor of Dialogue, co-editor, and Albert Peck of Sunstone, and was there anybody else? From, I can't remember. Anyway, so I kidded later that it was battle between good and evil. <laughs> you know, we got the general authority ahead of us, and we got these, you know, questionable periodical people behind me, and of course, uh, I was in the middle. Uh, so it was the, ba the battle of good and evil, and, and good and you know light and darkness, and and uh, and so anyway, so the um, the pilot pulls all the way around and starts coming in for another landing, and uh, you could cut the tension on the plane with a knife practically. It was it was bad, and he set it down for a, a perfect landing, and just like you see in the movies, there was just this enormous applause from all the passengers who were grateful to have their lives back. Um, <clears throat> did he ever say why he... Oh yeah, yeah, that's a good question. He did say, um, and he was very nonchalant about it. He goes, oh, sorry about that, folks. There was uh, another plane on the runway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, if that's all it was, I thought it was something serious. So, yeah, um, I've had a few of those, actually, but we won't go into that tonight. Another really, uh, so that's one extreme, and, and I won't go into detail, but one of the greatest spiritual experiences I've ever had, Marty was present uh, at the Kirtland Temple uh, Mormon History Association meeting there, uh, an incredible emotional and spiritual experience uh, in the Kirtland Temple. Um, so, I don't even, I reminded her of that recently and um, I think it brought back memories for both of us. So, I, mean, I will tell you a couple of her accomplishments, um, but more importantly, besides that, I will tell you right now, um, Marty is professor in the College of Architecture and Planning and Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean of Undergraduate Studies at the University of Utah. So. You can actually have affairs academically? Is that? Oh, I guess I'm, okay. She, uh, she taught at BYU. Um, I didn't say you were. Uh, she received teaching a teaching, uh, teaching excellence award there. Uh, she was president of the Mormon History Association, was, as I mentioned earlier, co-editor of Dialogue. Uh, and in 2013 received a very prestigious award the Leonard Arrington Award for Meritorious and Distinguished Service to Mormon History from the Mormon History Association. Uh, one of her books, um, where is the, do we not have the four Zionas anywhere? 
I wish we had more of them. Okay. Well, anyway, that one best book award. Yeah, we're victims of our own success, Marty, because some of the, your books have already sold out. Um, but uh, this, oh, there's one right there. Hold it up, Ann. The Forzine has won Best Book Award from the MHA. Um, we do have some of Marty's other books. Um, the one we've heard or come to hear about particularly tonight, Glorious and Persecution, Joseph Smith, American Prophet, 1839-1844. For those of you who do not know, this is part of a trilogy. Uh, Richard Excuse me, Richard Van Wagner wrote uh, the first volume, which should be out this fall, Gary, Ron, this fall probably. Um, and then uh, the, the third volume has gone through some iterations, and uh, Dan Bogle, as I understand it, is now working on volume <coughs> three, which we have no idea. Oh, excuse me, what did I, what did I say? Volume two, sorry. This is the last one. Uh, this is the final. I apologize for that. Um, anyway, there's three. That's the important thing. So um, this, uh, I was going to say that BYU studies said about pedestals and podiums. Um, Bradley's research is, oh, I thought it said exhausting, but it's exhaustive. <laughs> Succinct, ironic, and catchy. Um, Marty is a wonderful writer, as you will see when you read this book. She's a fine historian, and more importantly, uh, she's a good friend, and a good friend to, to Mormon history and people like us that live uh, because authors and historians like her produce quality work. And thanks so much for coming to, to hear this tonight, Marty Bradley. I'm so happy to be here tonight, and I have to say I feel really emotional. It's sort of like old home night to see so many longtime friends and um, colleagues in this journey over the past 20, 30 years in exploring um, meeting in the Mormon past. It, it, it means so much to me to see so many of you today. I, I especially want to thank a few of you. I am so absolutely tickled that Corinne and Earl Wonderly are here. These are just fantastic friends. Uh, Earl's own work, um, two of the best human beings I, I've known in my life. I've been so privileged to be friends with you. I'm just so happy you're here. And Connie and Carol and Dan and Gary and Ron and all of you that are here. It means so much to me that you would come out on a hot night and be here. But most of all, Katie Sexton, rock star, pal to me at work. I just can't even tell you how moved I am that you made the effort to be here tonight. It means the world to me. If anyone in this room besides Gary could tell you what a nervous Nelly I am and how anxious I was about being here tonight, this is actually the first time I've ever talked about Joseph Smith in public, which is kind of hard to believe, isn't it? Um, I have. I wrote this book and did the research and, and went through the amazing editing process with Gary in a very interior way. And so much of what I'll share with you tonight and that I hope you'll enjoy as you read the book is just, it's been in my head for a really long time and it's actually a sort of private thing to share that with you and hope that it helps you to understand maybe some of the really perplexing parts of Joseph Smith's life and make some sense out of some of the issues that, that you know, we, we sometimes really struggle with. Um, when I was at Mormon History Association a couple of weeks ago, I cannot even tell you how many people came up to me and said something like, uh, why didn't I know you were working on this book? Or, this isn't your thing. Why, why did you write a book about Joseph Smith? Or why another book about Joseph Smith? And just over and over again, and even really good friends that I had had as colleagues in my writing for years and years just couldn't understand why I would want to take Joseph Smith on. 
I've always sort of delighted in describing my research interests and my books as eclectic. And uh, those few of you who brought books, uh, boxes of my books tonight, can you know what I'm talking about. I've had a range of different things that have seized my interest over the years. And I, but when I, at, at my age, and I'm not going to tell you that, because it's none of your business, when I look back on my life and I think about what has most interest me or, or really kept my interest over time, there is definitely a continuum. Um, I remember the time um, when I was very young, just right out of my bachelor's degree, and I heard on the news, and I was living in California, the story of the Short Creek Raid. And I still was so idealistic, you know, coming out of a history major. You think that America is this absolute set of rules and ethical behaviors, and I just couldn't believe that the raid on Short Creek had happened. And from that point in time until now, which is four decades, I've wanted to understand the meaning around the experience of those of us who practice plural marriage. And so in part, this book, Glorious and Persecution, is an effort to figure out the context um, where all of that began. But you must know it is way, way more than that. That is a piece of it, it's certainly a layer of it, but it's not, that's not the only thing that this book is about. I've written this account of Joseph Smith's biography spanning his life as if it were a series of layers. And I've always, regardless of whether I'm talking about cities or neighborhoods or a person's life, I've always been interested in the sort of layered nature of those things that we study. And if you think about it, with Joseph's life, there were some things that were obvious to everyone that you could just see. You could see what he did in public. You could see what he said in public. And then below that was a layer of the experiences that played out in a private world that might have played out with his family or with his closest friends, but it was definitely below, it was, it, it was beneath the public layer. And then there was a layer of events and practices and statements that were intentionally obscure. So they were not only beyond beyond view, but they were intentionally obscured for some particular reason. And what I argue in this book is that ritual was many times the reason that much of his life was obscured from view, because it was a way of protecting ritual. And so those, those layers, um, moving from the most public to the most subterranean, is a way of understanding his life. And what I would use uh, as a way of describing this subterranean level is the term liminality. And I don't know if you all know that, but this wonderful theorist named Victor Turner talks about liminal space as the space that people enter in religious ritual that lifts them up above the ordinary lives that we live on the earth and gives us a sense of what more is possible. And it might be possible when we reach heaven or we reach some other life, but it's more than what we have, more than what we experience what right now. And there are many themes in this book that I develop, um, but one that I thought I would talk to, to you about tonight is what I would call the prophet narrative. I believe that Joseph Smith saw himself as a prophet and that he understood the prophet's role and reality and spent much of his time trying to explain it to others. He, if you read his sermons, if you listen to what he said, if you <clears throat> read what his clerks wrote about him, he's many times trying to explain himself. He's, this explanatory narrative that he develops is, is about him trying to explain to others what it meant to be a prophet, but also to understand himself what that meant. Um, years and years ago, I was teaching a service learning class at the University of Utah, and I used this wonderful book called The Soul of the Citizen by Paul Loeb, and he talked about a theory of narrative that he called explanatory styles, and, and the idea is that the way we talk about ourselves reveals traces of who we think we are or who we think we ought to be. And so I play with this idea that Joseph was developing a prophet narrative that was explaining to all of us or the people around him what he thought a prophet should do or be or think. And part of that was what he thought others thought he should do. I mean, it's really complex to unravel it. 
but that explanatory style, and each one of us have a different style of explaining ourselves. If you just think about it, if you think, uh, when I deal with students, some of them like to say, I'm a community-based service person, I'm a service person, or I'm a research person. They're explaining themselves by putting themselves in a sort of box that has this consistent set of behaviors. And so when he stood up, he repeatedly told others about his role of his prophet. In that, he was also his own audience. He was telling himself. I, I don't think any of us, when we're born, we understand what it means to be a prophet, right? He was evolving into this role, trying to understand what it was. I don't think we'll ever know how anxious that made him. You know, it couldn't have been easy, but um, part of that was this ongoing series of steps or, or ways that he uh, attempted to understand what this new knowledge meant, what it meant to be a prophet, and how he obtained that self-knowledge through the telling of his story. And once you start applying this framework to just about any event in Joseph Smith's life, it, it really explains a lot. And it's a, I thought it was a really powerful, once I came, came up with this theme and I applied it throughout the, the story, it just helped everything make better sense. That he was essentially narrating with his life and the things that he said, what he thought it meant to be a prophet. I think it's possible for us to think also about what inspired him in his interpretations of being a prophet. And part of that was the context that he emerged from. Uh, there were other prophets that he would have known about. You know, the prophetess Anne Lee who led the Shakers, or the prophet who was the head of the Oneida colony, John Humphrey Noyes. He would have heard about other prophets. He would have believed that it was possible to be a prophet. And I think that in some ways is one of the most foundational truths of his life. He was a person whose mind was opened up to the, po the possibility of, of being a prophet, that prophets do exist. Um, narrative theory, theory also helps us in this, in the idea that the self is always a work in progress. And I think if you think about the way you tell your own story, or you imagine your own story, or you think about your own life, it's never static. It's always changing. You know, the older you get, you start thinking of yourself as an older person. And you remember your youthful self. You remember when you could tap dance on a table, right? With, with, with glee. And how much more restricted you are as an older person. And so our story shifts as we move through different moments in our life. I love the way Joseph weaves together the events in his life and the life of the people around him and creates meaning. I, I think much of what he was doing was meaning making. So he would find out about something that happened to the saints or one of the members or one of his friends or that happened to himself and then he would weave a story around it. And when I say that I don't mean on any level that he was making a story up or making a lie up. It's not that. He is taking the fabric of a story of a narrative stream and then creating meaning or interpreting it for the people around him. I think it's also really important that Joseph Smith never thought of himself as an ordinary person. You know, I, I have you ever had a moment in your life where you thought, yeah, I'm just kind of average or I'm, I'm just really sort of an ordinary guy or an ordinary gal. He never thought that. He always thought of himself as having an experience that was different from the people around him. And he was acutely aware of that. And I think that in many important ways that opened him up to exploring uncharted territory or places that other people didn't go and really moving across a continuum of space and time that opened up new possibilities to him. He held the profound belief that becoming a god himself was a reality, that it was in, within reach. And he didn't understand when it would happen or how it would happen. He certainly started sketching out the ways that one might anticipate that, but he really believed, in my opinion, that that was possible. And even though, and one of the reasons I find Joseph Smith so very interesting, and I can't even tell you at the end of all of this how immensely interesting I find him. He's just weird, weirdly complex and, uh, and layered in his experience of the world. Um, but even though sometimes he was deeply doubtful 
of his capability, of his, even the quality of the moves that he made, the thought of becoming a god at some point in the continuum time was a lodestar that drew him forward and even in the darkest nights and those moments of the deepest anomie and do you know that concept anomie is is normlessness so when all the rules or all the predictability of life fell away he still could find his way forward because he believed that this was a possibility for him and I think that that <coughs> concept or self-concept is what made it possible for him to move into the domain of plural marriage, which is so very difficult. It's so challenging for us to understand because it's, it's for many of us, so very foreign. But this opening up of possibilities and, and the way they discarded the rules and the boundaries of uh, regular life uh, was part of what drew him forward. I think it certainly was expressed in the Council of Fifty and many of the innovations that he brought forward in this very brief moment in time. If you think about your own life in the past four years, how fleeting that has been. I mean, I just barely started in undergraduate studies. It feels like yesterday and it's already been, I'm at the end of my fourth year. That's the entire time period that's covered in this book. And it's so incredibly packed with really important doctoral changes and changes in terms of practices. And certainly the way he talks about his experience and the experience of others. Um, another really important part of the story, and again, something that I just found so profoundly interesting and moving was everything that Joseph experienced, or have any of you ever read the Times and Seasons or the Millennial Stars? It's so interesting because it tells the story of Nauvoo and then it'll tell you about some earthquake in Guatemala. I mean, it's always, there's always some mention of some terrible event somewhere else in the world. And I think that's because Joseph saw religious significance, apocalyptic significance in every example of that throughout the world. It, it was proof positive of this, this sort of framework around the world that he was developed. And certainly every instance of persecution, and this is of course the most central theme in this book, was something that he interpreted as being significant, as a sort of testing ground for the viability of this Mormon vision of heaven and the ideal of community life that they had. And the work that they were doing was work that they were chosen to do in this interpretive framework that he developed in the prophetic uh, narrative. It was certainly the fulfillment of prophecy and the doctrine of covenants, and if you remember, that's the book of revelations that he gathers of his own work. Um, but he sees a continuity, and he reminds the Mormons of that. The other really important theme that runs through this time period is Missouri. And I remember when I first dove into this book, I had no idea um, you know, when I wrote the four Zinas, I really hated writing about when they were in Missouri because it's, it's just really messy. It's a really messy time period. And, you know, you never knew for sure if they were in Ohio and Missouri or if they're going forward or backwards. And I, I, I just, I didn't love Missouri. But, and so here I, I sign on to do Nauvoo, and I think, oh, we're done with Missouri, and I don't have to worry about Missouri, but Missouri is everywhere in terms of uh, shaping the direction of Nauvoo. And it's really Joseph's response and continuing obsession to get vengeance and retribution in terms of the persecution that they experienced in Missouri that drove pretty much everything in terms of the movement forward in, in, in Nauvoo. Uh, Missouri certainly, and the theme of persecution shaped Joseph's prophet, prophethood in Nauvoo and his movement towards the last parts of his life. Um, I think that uh, efforts to try and understand Joseph's life in Nauvoo are really complicated by his own record, and in part because he's always surrounded by scribes. And so you, you hardly ever see Joseph's own writing about a particular event. It's almost always a scribe writing about something he said or scribe writing about a sermon. Um, and so if you think about it, there's a layer of interpretation around him always. 
and it, in my mind that's actually more interesting because it's a, it's a way of thinking about the way others heard the prophet narrative. They were interpreting the significance of what he was saying was significant uh, through their own emphasis and the writing that they recorded about everything that he did. <coughs> I think Joseph, more than anyone else of his generation, anticipated the future. He imagined us here today thinking and talking about his life. He knew that what he was doing was significant and that the saga of the Mormon people would be told over and over again in a way that would be um, needed to be meaningful. It, it would become a religious drama a religious narrative that would be significant in the lives of the people that would follow behind him. And I have to say miracles and disasters and illness and marriages and parties, I mean all of it is sort of gets equal time on the stage in this narrative. I think if you think about the uniqueness of the story that he, tell, he told with his life, it really starts with the first vision, doesn't it? That that was one of the first stories that was <clears throat> totally unique. But then once it gets to Nauvoo, it's the story of Missouri persecution, which was important to his own personal identity, but then also the identity of the group. And I have to say that the core narrative thread that runs through at least my telling of Joseph Smith's story, and that's all this book is, it's just me putting my head to the subject of Joseph Smith in Nauvoo is this the uh, significance of persecution in the life of a single individual and the life of a community of people. That they were able to endure it, they were in, able to resist it, that eventually they were able to flee beyond it. And I think Joseph Smith was always really aware of this. There's a wonderful uh, quote from September 1st, 1842 where he says, as for the perils which I am called to pass through, they seem but a small thing to me, as the envy and wrath of man have been my common lot all, my, all the days of my life. And for what cause it seems mysterious, unless I was ordained from before the foundation of the world, for some good end or bad, but nevertheless, and this is the part I love, deep water is what I am wont to swim in. It has become second nature to me. And so that's... That's sort of the way he interpreted his own experience. So the stories Joseph told of Missouri, of Kirtland, of heaven, uh, explain the meaning of his life as a prophet and his community as a persecuted and martyred people. And again, none of it was, was surprising. It was predicted. It was in scripture. It was the performance of revelation that was playing out in front of his people. The other thing that I found really interesting in the story of Nauvoo was the idea of, of sacred community building. For Joseph, the Mormon community was building a sacred world. And the parameters of Zion, and they many times would call it the kingdom of God, represented in a way the spatial dimensions of the meaning of his own life. And he was referencing or framing the prophetic role in a world that he helped create and that he would inhabit. And I think the social world that was related to this idea of the kingdom of God is really about a web of relationships. Really, really complex web of relationships. You know, last week I reread this book thinking about tonight, and I remember going home uh, one night from work and just thinking, oh my gosh, <laughs> what was I thinking that I should take on this project? It's so incredibly complex. And, you know, it's sort of a story that takes 10 years, which, you know, it took me more than 10 years to actually do this, think, thanks to Gary Bergera. Um, but it's, it's a story that you have to take time with. Uh, you have to think about some of the complexities for a long time before it starts to all the pieces start together. So I would encourage you to take some, take some time with this and, and don't, don't accept that you understand what it means at first glance. Um, he also always built conflict into the story. Um, he had sort of a knack at putting a twist in the way he told the story or in, he gave a sermon or he 
He presented a narrative so that conflict was sort of the baseline. It seems to be one of the ways he found meaning, but also the way um, he explained it to others. One of the other big, um, and you know, I was thinking about this the other day, that this book is so different than it would have been if I had written it 20 years ago or 15 years ago, because it also reflects what I have been thinking about and working on and teaching at school. And my venture into theory, um, I think, is reflected in this book. And one of the theorists that I've just been so inspired by and who, who for me really made the difference in trying to understand his entrance into plural marriage is a, is a sociologist named Victor Turner. And Lindsay, you should read Victor Turner, all the Victor Turner you can get your hands on. He writes about ritual and um, this idea of liminality and an, another concept com uh, called communitas, it really helps you think about uh, the ritual around plural marriage, not only as the ritual where a person is married to another person, but the larger context, the sacred world that Joseph Smith creates around plural marriage that, that um, supported it, that kept it hidden, that helped explain it to the different persons who entered it. And I just find it immensely uh, satisfying and actually sort of exciting to use uh, the concept of ritual and uh, liminality to think about plural marriage in a, in a really different way. I think it's, uh, it's certainly the central paradigm in the book around plural marriage, but what it, what it did is it, it created a sort of justification and I don't think Joseph ever thought about it in this intentional way, but there, there's sort of simple truth, which is, again, this first layer of truth, which, you, with, which is what you see. And then there's the second system of, of truth, which is the truth of the ritual or the doctrine that the ritual is based on. And so much of what is true about plural marriage was actually hidden by the ritual nature of it. And I find it a really interesting way of, of making meaning out of that. Um, this concept of liminality is where a person enters a ritual and they essentially step out of the world, the ordinary world, where we do our work in the fields or we wash dishes. Um, and you might go to the temple and do endowments or you enter into some sort of spiritual connection with others. And it makes you think that everything is possible because you did that. It's a, it's a different sort of state. And he uses the term liminality and anomy um, to explain that sort of difference. And so I think it's a really helpful way of thinking about religious ritual, whether it's plural marriage or the temple endowment, the second anointing, all of that fits really nicely into this larger analysis of ritual. Um, I think that it was, uh, I think ritual was key to everything in Nauvoo. I think it was through ritual that Joseph Smith brought his followers to a transformative state. And in that transformative state, he promised them so much. You know, he said to them, you can become gods and goddesses in, in your future lives if you do this and if you do this and you remain faithful. And that's a really amazing, heady promise, right? And that ritual became a sort of threshold that was an entrance point where they moved from one way of being into, the, into another way of being. Um, Joseph kept secrets from just about everyone. He kept secrets from the public. He kept secrets from some of his wives. He kept secrets from Emma. He kept secrets from some of his most trusted um, fellow uh, uh, general authorities. And their entrance into the secret world of ritual was staged in a way, and it became a sort of test of loyalty and certainly your proximity to the core truth of that ritual was something that reflected how much um, uh, Joseph trusted you. I think another really uh, poignant moment, and if I had chosen the image for the cover, it would have been Joseph teaching at the stand. I, I think that his sermons in the field outside of the temple were so incredibly important uh, and powerful. Um, I have always had in my mind an image of Joseph Smith in a, in a domestic setting with a group of 20 people 
uh, developing his theology or, or explaining to them the mysteries of his, the religious vision that he was explaining. But if you think about him standing on a little platform and talking without a microphone for hours in front, in front of as many as 10,000 people with the, this sort of imagined space of the temple to the side of him, that's where he really he really extends his impact and changes the lives of huge numbers of people. I thought it was interesting in, in the end of my writing of this book to think about how the life of a prophet like Joseph Smith is different from the life of a, a regular human being. And, you know, if you really do have a, an experience with the sublime, and I don't try and place a judgment on that in this book, does it change you? Um, does it change the way you experience everything in life? And does that cast a shadow over the rest of your life? I actually think only one of the questions um, was, was his claim to having talked to God um, true. It's only one of hundreds of questions that the study of this really interesting man uh, inspire in us. And I think his answers to those questions are best seen in these sermons, in these small settings when he's speaking to small groups of people who believed in his word, and certainly in the way he lives his life and the practice of his life. Another thing I thought I would talk just briefly about tonight is, is the role of women in all of this, right? Because, you know, when people say, why another book about Joseph Smith? I, the thing I always think to myself and I don't really say is, well, I've never written about a book about Joseph Smith before. So, you know, I think the fact that I bring to this book all of the years that I've been writing about plural marriage or about the lives of women, um, I think that's important because I saw much of what went on in his life through, the le through this lens that was colored by this, this kind of lifetime of thinking about the role of gender in the, in the lives of religious persons. And what I found was that, and again, I think this is so colored by the scribes and who's writing the stories about Joseph's life, but women are sort of silent in it. Even though we have records of what women wrote in their journals or in their letters or what they said at Relief Society, they're sort of in the backdrop. They're in the background of this religious drama. And as was true for all of the men who accepted entrance into plurality uh, and the interpretation of the celestial kingdom and this notion about, about godhood, women were essential to that. Plurality could not have happened if women weren't part of that that reality. And although women met in private prayer groups and they blessed each other's babies and they built homes and I think in my Four Sinus book I really argue for the important role that women played in the community building of the LDS. They still are, they're off to the side of this important drama that's playing out primarily, primarily with the men. Um, his ideas about gender were very much of his moment in time. He wasn't a radical in his interpretation of the role that women play in all of this. And if you think about it, women didn't join the Council of 50, even though they were in the Relief, Relief Society. They didn't vote to throw out the dissenters who over, uh, threatened to overturn the church because of the destruction of the Navo Expositor. They weren't on the city council. But they were in the audience at the stand as Joseph spoke, and they certainly helped build this important communitas, which was such an important part of the story of Nauvoo. One of the reasons why I've been so interested in Joseph Smith was my whole lifetime of hearing the story of persecution that was so much a central design motif in terms of the Mormon experience. And if you think about it, as soon as he died, that became the central defining myth of, LDS, of the LDS experience. The mortar, martyrdom of the Mormon prophet uh, explained why they should leave Nauvoo, why they should seek a new Zion in the Rocky Mountains, why they could, should continue to do missionary works and gather new members. That narrative is continued all the way down to the present. And whether one believes that Joseph Smith was a prophet um, the people who followed him were filled with incredibly potent 
reality-orienting sense of what that meant. And to them, it meant that he had communed with God, that his mind and heart, his whole being had filled with what he interpreted to be answers to prayers. And with those understandings, for him came this overwhelming responsibility to turn his life to this Zion-building enterprise. And he did that all the way down to his death. And if you think about it, the church that he founded continued to use this prophet's narrative to inspire faith and devotion and a willingness to follow his description of the true path to heaven and what constituted righteous living. And I think the story, this persecution narrative is where LDS um, identity begins and certainly where it might end. Just because he was a prophet, uh, if you buy this way of thinking, it doesn't mean his life was easy. He struggled with big conflicts and part of that was because he was a human being and he was flawed. Um, he sometimes exhibited intensely conflicted human behavior. He was on the one hand a really compelling creative genius as has been argued in many places, but he also messed up on occasion and had to deal with the profound implications or consequences of those mistakes. But through it all, he believed that God was and that he could be God himself. And I think there will be an endless debate over whether Joseph actually saw God or when, but I believe that Joseph believed he was a prophet, that he spent his entire life all the way down to the very last hours of his life trying to figure out what the heck that meant. Um, certainly other charismatic figures sketched out a dramatic worldview, a religious vision to uh, that was parallel with him, but if you think about it, all those other communal experiences went away. They failed. And Joseph Smith's is the only one that continues down to the present. And I think that's largely because of this really compelling prophet narrative that he had articulated with his life. I think it gives the Mormon people a course of action, reminding them to turn an eye towards heaven and a desire for godhood certainly create a really compelling idea about building a holy silly city and a sanctified community on life, and I think so many of those things are themes that run through the Mormon experience. Another thing, I wish I had a, another 45 minutes to talk to you about this, but I, I find so interesting the role of God in all this, <laughs> that you know Joseph's telling this experience about what it, he thinks it means to be a prophet, but God's a player in that. God is a personality. He's a, he's a person in, he's a figure in this prophet narrative. And I think Joseph's desire pulled him towards God and made it impossible for him to not try to understand, to search for meaning, to search for the presence of this uh, throughout all of his life. And I actually think that fear was part of that, that the fear of all the alternative of being denied that possibility was also an activator as, of him as well. And I think that the <coughs> Joseph's God became meaningful in the context of the story of the Latter-day Saints and was manifested as they moved into the Rocky Mountains across the Mississippi River and where they settled where, where other people had not. I think that um, the buildings that they built in Nauvoo were just shells without the practice that was inspired by this kind of belief. The ritual that they performed in homes and groves and uh, together in public and private spaces made everything that they did sacred and dedicated it to God. And again, Joseph spent his whole life through these kinds of experiences trying to figure out what it meant to be a prophet. So, in conclusion, what I believe I have contributed to the many books about Joseph Smith and his experience in Nauvoo is a fresh interpretation of the meaning of his experience, of his meaning-making enterprise in developing a prophet narrative, an articulation of the Mormon experience of persecution, the liminality of Nauvoo ritual that opened up the possibilities inherent in plural marriage and the temple endowment and the political kingdom of God, and certainly in the Mormon expansion of the ideal of heaven, the potential of an individual for godhood, and a defining narrative powerful enough to carry the church to the present day. So, 
I guess this is where I open up for questions. Thank you. Oh, there you are. Just go ahead and field them. Anyone have a question? Yes. Uh, so people think of, uh, you mentioned Freemasonry, they immediately think of the temple endowment. But beyond that, do you see influence from Freemasonry on Joseph Smith and ritual and secrecy and other aspects? What, what do you see? Sure. I, I think that the 1840s and the United States are such an interesting time period to study because there is this widespread um, interest in, in association in private societies that have rituals that remind the members of the group um, how to live, whether it's righteous or good ethical moral lives. And I see Freemasonry as an expression of the same thing that plays out in the temple. Um, it's not at all surprising that the visual language, the symbolic language is sometimes similar and that some of the ritual or the practices look look very similar because it's, it's part of the cultural language of that moment in time. Um, I remember, I anyone at Chi Omega, you're a Chi Omega, aren't you? I remember when I went through the Chi Omega initiation, I, it, it is so much like Freemasonry or, or, or ceremonies that might play out in a religious. So, you know, there are many organizations, institutions, um, particularly from this moment in time, that had highly ritualized ways of reminding human beings how to live lives that would get them to a better place. And the, you know, the line between Freemasonry and Mormonism was fine in some places, not in all, but it was based on that same, they, they really loved to get together and do rituals that reminded them um, I love the staircase, if any of you ever been in the Masonic Temple, and the staircase is, it has the same words as in the Boy Scout headquarters. <laughs> they're, they're just really good common sense ways of, of marching up a staircase or moving up towards heaven, whatever the metaphor is. They're just reminders of ways that we can live lives that, that get us to a better place. So, good, good question. It's one of the most fascinating parts of studying the 1840s, I think. There's so much of that going on throughout the country. Yes, Dan. All right, uh, kind of tying into that, um, I actually, Victor Turner, I'm, I'm a fan too. Back my master's thesis was on theories of ritual empowerment, and I was basically using masonry as a substitute for Mormonism about why people yeah. don't go to this crazy ritual and feel better when they come out. What is it? It doesn't. So Victor Turner, I'm, I'm really excited that he's part of your book. What the question is, is more like you, you now have this, it's a wonderful theory, it's very elegant and stuff like that. And in some ways when you throw a theory on stuff that's almost more like you stumble your way right. into insights, right. that then all of a sudden the theory can make it look really profound. <laughs> you know, because, so I'm guessing like for instance, in some ways you colored for us Plural marriage and digestible, you're not quite as, you know, as so many people are about plural marriage. Do you sense that he had any of this, well, I need layers of secrecy, and I need this because of the, the sorts of things that, that the theoretical stuff is giving you? Do you think he had that back in 1832? Or did he have that, you know, prior to this? Or is this like a growing thing? And how do we explain the messiness of getting there and when a nice theory yeah. makes it all look like, man, maybe God really wasn't involved <laughs> the whole way. You know, um, the theory doesn't help that much. The okay. th theory helps me in an intellectual way to even keep working on that, on the on 42 and 43. Okay. Because if you stumbled on every single new marriage and every new rationale that we we develop, right? Oh, we need an older woman so she would take messages to the younger woman, or whatever we do to try and understand it, it's still really, really messy. And, you know, for me, and I've been working on plural marriage for a really long time, and you just can't, I, I, you couldn't do that if you got tripped up with all of that. You couldn't, it'd make you sick. Or it just, you, you would never feel like you had ever made any difference with your, your work. Um, but f for me, it what it does is it places 
that ritual and even that messiness in a larger stream of human history of religious persons, whether they're in a jungle in Africa or in Argentina or in upstate New York or in Utah, there, it, it's that same human instinct. We want to believe our lives have more meaning than it seems like they do right now. We want to believe that we, even if we're clumsy in our effort, we want to believe that we can get to a higher plane. And, you know, for all the messiness of the ritual of plural marriage and the family situations and who married who when, um, for me, that human desire for, and I, Katie can say this, I love... I love the idea of imagining the possibilities. I use that. I use Victor Turner in talking about what we're trying to do for undergraduates. I mean, I quote him almost every hour of every single day. I just love that idea so much because it turns it turns your head around, and it just help it helps you believe that more is possible for you. Have you ever wondered why people go to the temple? I mean, it's kind of a hassle. Some of it is interesting. Um, sometimes it's really great, sometimes it's disappointing. Um, one time when I went to the temple, the temple matron told me I couldn't be Eve because my dress was too messy. My, it was wrinkled from being in my suitcase. <laughs> that was a really negative experience for me, it, you know. So some, sometimes it, it, it doesn't work, but you go, you, you, if you do that, you go back because you believe that something about it is going to change your life. And maybe the life of your family, or maybe your marriage, or whatever it is that in your mind seems like, you, you know, I, I just find that so incredibly compelling. And for me, that trumps the messiness of it. And the other thing, the longer you do this kind of research, and the more you get to know Joseph Smith, or Eliza Partridge, or whomever, you just see them as human beings, you know. And if you think about how many times you mess up in your own life, and you just times that by a thousand, of course it's it's just going to be, they're human beings trying to make sense out of something that someone told them God wanted them to do and they don't have a rule book and they're trying to find their way towards it. I just find the humanity in that so amazingly compelling. Um, and you know, last Thursday night when I reread, when I was done rewriting my book, I and I had read chapter 12, 10 and 12, read my big plural marriage chapters. And I just felt sick at the idea of having to talk my way through it because it is so complicated. And it just takes time to, and for me, I don't think I'm hiding behind theory. And I don't think I'm implying that theory cleans it up because it's, it's just human beings trying to figure out how to get to a point where their lives become more than what they have. I find that compelling. Yes. A couple of questions. One, just uh, curious, in Nauvoo, were there many people that weren't members of the church? Sure. At that time? Yeah. There, uh, Joseph Jackson is a prominent um, person who came in and, and tried to benefit by association with some of the LDS. But yeah, I mean, they're a majority population, but there are people traveling through um, who come and try to make money off of them. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. And then, uh, in your uh, in your studies and your research, is there anything that stands out that really uh, surprised you in what you learned, or is it all just kind of you know um, rehashed? Or? I and again, I thought this so many times along the way, but there are some points in the book where I lay out a day, like you know, we did this meeting where they talked about. Oregon, and then, and then he performed a marriage, and then he dealt with some thorny political issue, and then, you know, I just, I, 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 I guess I was really stunned at how difficult every single day of his life in that time period must have been, and I actually, I think it's one of the reasons why I really love the stories when <clears throat> there are lots of, I mean, there's so many. The people who were around him wrote about their experience with him, and we have many of those records. But I love the ones where he gets down and wrestles with little kids, or he gets dirty, or he makes some goofy joke or something, because 
the pressure of that daily grind of his life is it's it's extraordinary and the fact that he kept articulating this vision and this optimism and this belief um, I, I think it says so much of, about what an extraordinary human being he was you know regardless of where you fall in thinking about him he, he was really something and I, 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 I it, you know it made him so much more interesting to see the complexity of his life yeah yes you treated all the Joseph's thought process or reasoning behind instituting the holy garment during that time? Well, you know, it's just, yeah, the question is about, I, I don't talk about his thought process because we don't have a record of his thought process. Yeah, I didn't know if you it, no, but, anything that may lead you in that direction. Yeah, no, uh, it, but for, for me it's part of this this cultural context of wearing costumes um, around the ritual. It's It's really common in other religious groups that were founded during the mid-19th century to have some sort of garb that is associated with the ritual. So it's, it's very much, I think, contextualized in that larger cultural landscape of ritual and the expression of the ritual. But, no, I, don't, I wish I could. It would be wonderful to get in his head about any of it, wouldn't it? Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, Ron. Let, let me just say something. Um, there are so many interesting details that, that you have in the book that I don't know if, if you really, if, if people understand, but also it's told in such an interesting way. I mean, it's a story we all know, and yet you, you never stop and dwell on anything that we already know, and the story moves along. It's almost like reading fiction or something, but. But you seem to trust that the readers will understand what you're talking about and come along with you, and you, and you don't talk down to them. Uh, That's so really, nice of you to say. I really like that about <laughs> That's the nice of you. Also, people have said it has a woman's perspective that's so uh, different and interesting. But clearly, you had to make a decision about who the audience is and how you were going to uh, approach that. I suppose you're writing to this group um, and to, let's say, to Mormons, uh, college educated. Uh, mm -hmm. did, did you have the audience in mind and make a conscious well, <laughs> decision I, not yeah. to stop and explain things with the rest yeah. of us already know? Yeah, definitely. You know, and that's partly that there's so many books about Joseph Smith, right? So sure. you sort of assume that even if you stop someone on the street, they'd know the basic outline of the story. and. For all of us, we've read books about plural marriage, and we've read, read books about the martyrdom, and you know, so much of that is just sort of assumed knowledge, and so I think the interpretation of that, and I love that you think I told the story along with that, because I sometimes worried that I was working so hard to find an interpretive framework for me to be able to push it. Um, that was super important to me, but I'm glad that there's still a nice their storyline. So thank you. Marty, can you tell a little bit about the cover, the picture on the cover? Sorry? <laughs> Gary, will you tell a little bit about the color, the cover <laughs> picture? <laughs> the, Jason, <laughs> Jason is the designer. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful paper? <laughs> so the cover image, um, you know, there's kind of a limit to what images exist currently out of I wanted something that was a little more period, not something that you were paying an illustrator to create, you know. Uh, and so I went off the title. Um, a good cover sells, you know, the title makes it look interesting, but kind of has this deep level of communication. So I was browsing for images that haven't been used by you know, Bushman and just about every book about Joseph Smith, they all, you know, all the images were used up. So I started looking for something that hadn't been used. And I went to the Library of Congress and found this uh, lithograph of, uh, you know, the kind of uh, death of Joseph Smith. And it was kind of this neoclassical Greek pose of Joseph laying there dying with people over him ready to cut his head off. You know, and it just had so much drama and just, you know, kind of all this persecution came to uh, 
a final moment. Yeah. And so that's kind of why we did that. Nicely done. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much.